enhancing internet freedom and human rights through responsible business practice. The ICT industry's growing impact on society is undeniable. This brings both new risks and new opportunities, sometimes with unpredictable consequences. Recently agreed principles and codes of conduct have built a framework for corporate conduct, but a main challenge is how the ICT industry can carry out its due diligence. What tools are needed to support corporations to ensure that their activities respect human rights? Okay, so welcome to day two of the uh, Sweden, Sweden Internet Forum. Um, congratulations to, for making it to this point and uh, welcome. I hope that you weren't in the situation that I was in when I went to the, the cafe bar to grab a coffee and I was pushing the jar like this and there was nothing coming out. So excuse me, the moderator hasn't had a cup of coffee yet, but I'll do my best. Um, hopefully my, my co-panelists have. Um, I actually just wanted to first touch on um, the amazing dinner last night and the wonderful speech from Frank LaRue, which I thought was totally inspirational. I've been thinking about it all evening. Um, this, this session will address the, the challenges and the opportunities that corporations face um, in the implementation of internationally agreed uh, human rights um, frameworks and principles and codes of conduct. We're going to explore some of the questions around due diligence. Um, what sort of support do companies need when um, attempting to protect the human rights of their users? How do they ensure that their practices, their policies, their technologies, their networks, their hardware um, does not undermine human rights? Um, my organisation, Access, uh, we're a global movement for digital freedom. We believe in the importance, the fundamental importance of an open internet um, because increasingly it is the gateway to all human rights, as I think Frank um, outlined last night. Uh, we held the Silicon Valley Human Rights Conference at the end of last year, which brought together technology companies to try to get them to understand the human rights implications of their platforms. I think at the outset, we really need to acknowledge uh, the significant and important role that, that telcos and internet companies have played in actually enabling the right to freedom of expression. And this is an important starting point because we're going to address specifically some of the challenges, but I think it's really essential that we think about the hundreds of millions, in fact, billions of people who are now connected as a result of such technologies. Um, by delivering networks, by providing open access, etc., telcos, in a sense, are freedom providers, uh, but we need to make sure that they're also not the, the partners. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Swedish hospitality. I won't comment on the fact that it's black and I want milk. <laughs> um, so, so we have with us some freedom providers uh, uh, um, sitting on either side of me. We need to, as I say, to ensure everyone get comfortable. Uh, that they are not the, the, the partners of dictators. Um, so users' rights to access, to freedom of expression, and to privacy are threatened. Uh, we've seen NARIS, for instance, which is a subsidiary of the Boeing company, uh, selling sophisticated surveillance equipment to Egypt. Uh, we've seen California's uh, blue coat systems um, being used in Syria. Um, and so these are some of the hard questions that I think we'd like to discuss today, honestly. Um, We've also, of course, seen some of the, the television programs, uh, the television program last night, uh, which looked at Tele Sonora's role in some of the uh, countries, including uh, Azerbaijan and Belarus. So let's have an honest conversation about that. I think that we've had many debates, um, we've had many forums about, uh, about internet freedom, but really we need to talk about the implementation and the real life scenarios that are taking place today. So let me introduce the panel because we've got some great people here. Um, Bennett Freeman, who's the Senior Vice President for Sustainability Research and Policy for Calvert Investments. Um, <clears throat> uh, then we have uh, on my left <laughs> as well, um, Elaine um, Vardaman, who is, is the um, uh, Vice President for Sustainability and Responsibility for the Ericsson Group Worldwide. 
Uh, then we have Gunnar um, Orm, who's the State Secretary to the Minister for Trade. Um, uh, on my right, we have Enrique, Enrique Aznar, who's the Chief Integrity Officer for Millicom International Cellular. And then we have Salil uh, Tripathi, who is from the Institute for uh, Human Rights and Business. So, let's start off with some opening questions. We're also going to have a look at a bit of a hypothetical later on. Um, but just to, to kick off, um, Bennett, for some of you uh, who, who know, and, and indeed those who don't know, has a lot of experience um, as an investor, um, as also an advisor to, to companies in terms of their, their sustainability policies, not just in this sector, but in a whole range of different sectors, both apparel, mining, extractives, etc. Bennett, can you lay out for us the broader debate that we're seeing here in the tech sector? How far do you think we've actually come in putting human rights uh, at the centre of the, the tech, se tech sector's agenda? And where do you think we're actually headed? <clears throat> Thank you, Brad. Um, good morning, and thanks uh, to you, Brad, and Access for being such a catalyst on these issues. Uh, and thanks also to the government of Sweden for convening this important and very timely conference. To hit your most specific question right on the head, I think that we have come far, but not nearly far enough, with much more work to be done, especially uh, in the ICT sectors. The good news is that if one steps back and looks at the broader range of industries around the world, that over the last dozen years, there has become a growing acceptance of a basic proposition. That proposition is that companies in virtually every industry face some degree of human rights related risks and responsibilities alike. Some industries, and you mentioned, Brett, uh, two in particular that uh, I've worked closely with over the years, along with many others, uh, extractives, oil, gas, and mining, footwear and apparel, old industries, low-tech in some ways, uh, high-tech perhaps in others, uh, but certainly not of the ICT world. These are industries that have faced very serious human rights issues that have been attacked by NGO campaigners, that have been challenged by socially responsible and increasingly by mainstream uh, <coughs> investors. The good news is, is that in those sectors and a number of others, there are now standards, guidelines, principles with real operational content which are guiding companies in assessing their risks and embracing their responsibilities. Even though some of the leading initiatives may be a decade or longer uh, on now, they're still even at relatively early stages. They're still demonstrating their own credibility and accountability. When one comes to the tech sector, my uh, frank view is that for all of the extraordinary technological and social impact, technological in innovation and social impact of the ICT sectors, that it's only been in the last several years that these sectors have begun to uh, really face up to human rights risks and responsibilities. In that sense, and I say this with great respect for the extraordinary achievements of this industry, in that respect, in my opinion, this sector is somewhat behind others. The good news, though, is twofold, and I'll end on, on this point. Uh, first, we have seen the emergence of uh, sector-specific uh, human rights principles. Um, you're all familiar with um, the Global Network Initiative. Uh, telco companies are exploring their own uh, potential initiative as well. There is significant ferment uh, in this industry finally now about very real risks and responsibilities, particularly insofar as they relate to freedom of expression and right to privacy. The other good news, and no doubt my friend and longstanding colleague, Salil Tarpathi, will address this point, uh, is that we've come now to a 
what I think is a real landmark uh, uh, turn of events in the international community in the sense that the UN last year unanimously endorsed uh, the guiding principles for business and human rights, which give operational uh, uh, meaning now to uh, the overall framework on business and human rights developed by uh, Professor John Ruggie. Uh, and we'll get into more of a discussion of that, I'm sure, <coughs> but the basic uh, utility for companies, including in this sector, uh, in the guiding principles is, excuse me, in the guiding principles is the due diligence process. And I would say that as an investor, but also as one who works with a number of human rights NGOs as well as with governments, that the first step is to understand and assess risks. And the due diligence framework embedded in the guiding principles, and I should add that the, uh, that uh, the Global Network Initiative, GNI, also includes a very specific risk, risk assessment uh, framework as well, are a starting point. We're still at early days, though, in this sector, and this is a very timely conference to help crystallize the issues and choices uh, before so, us. So we, we might be at an early stage, um, but as we heard last night, we have <clears throat> Uh, um, the percentage of the world which is currently connected yep. using mobile phones is like we need to catch up, right? We're at the early stages, but in fact the world is not at early stages. So let's let's look to um, to Salil and and perhaps Salil, you can provide us with what that framework, that international human rights framework, is. I'm not really interested in the centre. I'm interested in the fringes. I want to know what are the red lines that you think that companies should not cross. There are many red lines. I mean, let's be honest about it. Thank you, Brett. Uh, let's start at where we are. I mean, what we got from John Ruggi and his work and the Human Rights Council last year was a framework that essentially reminded that we live in a world of sort of shared responsibility and accountability. The primary obligation for protecting rights rests with the state, but companies do have, irrespective of that, a responsibility to respect rights. Respect doesn't only mean do no harm, but more than that. It means doing the due diligence, doing the assessment, and so on. But if you look at the principles per se, and if you look at the GNI and its framework per se, when it comes to the challenging decisions that companies have to make at the periphery, at the fringes, they help but only up to a point. I'm not saying that they don't help, but they help but only up to a point. Uh, Bennett referred to the fact that the oil and mining sector or the apparel sector started responding to challenges from NGOs. You could argue that even the tech sector started doing that. Uh, if we jog our memories, I think in early 2000 or late 90s, Human Rights Watch raised questions about Motorola providing certain surveillance equipment to the Chinese government. Likewise, it was Amnesty and Human Rights Watch which raised the issue of Xi Tao and Yahoo in China. Similarly, Michael Anti, I don't know if he's in the room here, but Michael Anti and his problems with Microsoft at one point. All of these questions started being raised by NGOs at a particular time. And companies realized that however libertarian their ethos might be, however respectful of individual freedoms they might be when it comes to facing the might of the state, they wonder what tools they have, how far they can do in saying no. And we see some very tragic consequences like what happened in Egypt last year where Vodafone and other telecom operators were told by the government at one point to switch off the network. And at another point, they were told that you have to pass out certain messages to certain subscribers, which led to not very nice consequences for people who are in the Tahrir Square. And is that a red line for you? It is a red line. So the red line that I'm coming to are acts which you commit directly. A government calls you and says, give us the address of this individual, and you provide the details for that. That is a direct act that you do, which is going to make someone vulnerable. That is a direct act. The other is the complicit act where you're assisting, you're aiding, you're encouraging, you're tolerating, you're acquiescing, you're contributing, you're benefiting from something that somebody else does, which actually causes an abuse, which would be the kind of thing when you prevent a particular communication to take place or prevent a particular transfer to take place. But it's not all that bleak, because you're talking about the state with the sovereignty under the Westphalian notion on one hand, and the company, which owes its origin only to a charter. So how do you break that cycle. And the message I would want to give to companies is that you're not alone. 
they are not the only, I mean, they, maybe they are not wired, maybe they are not designed, maybe they are not created to be human rights defenders, but other people are doing that. And there is safety in numbers. If companies come together and say that the requests you are making to the government are going to make us complicit in grave abuses, or if companies come together and say that if you ask us to do this, we will be violating things for which we would go to jail in our own home country. Mm -hmm. If companies were to say that what you're saying makes us liable for being possibly implicated in a crime against humanity, that becomes a strong argument in which the nation state should be backing them up, human rights NGOs should be backing them up, and the isolated entity should not be the company, but the government which is behaving badly. Okay. Thank you very much, and I think many issues that should um, permeate the discussion as we go along, issues of, of direct involvement, uh, of complicity, of the relationship between the company uh, and the state in which they are incorporated and the support that the government can provide for the company, the relationship between the company and the emerging market in, in which they're entering. Enrique from, <coughs> from Millicom, um, can you give us a sense of some of the principles that you have as a company that help you to decide how you should operate in some of these markets. Um, as um, some of you know, Millicom works in, in some challenging environments in, in Rwanda, um, in, the, uh, in Congo DRC, uh, and, and, and others uh, throughout Africa and also through Latin America. So it would be good to hear how you both take the principles and the red lines that Salil has outlined, perhaps also thinking about where you are in terms of ICT, uh, the ICT sector, and how it might um, be at the beginning or the middle, or at, um, in what stage of the <coughs> development the process is in terms of your human rights um, principles and your ability to implement them on the ground. Thank you, Brad. The first thing I want to say is that we are delighted to have been invited to this forum because it's a, an opportunity for us to express our views and our challenges. I'm also delighted to hear from Salil that uh, we are not alone, and I think that the objective of this discussion <coughs> for us is to make sure that we can work together. Um, because it is a, a common problem, and yeah. then we need to face it uh, jointly. Yeah. Um, as you said, uh, Millicom is, uh, is a mobile operator. Um, we are part of the Chinebic group. We operate in 14 countries uh, in Latin America and Africa. Um, many of them have been described or classified as not free by Freedom House. Um, they don't rank very well in Transparency International ranking. Um, we face, and some of them have been even defined as failed <coughs> country, failed states. Uh, so you can imagine that the challenges that we face in those countries are huge. On the other hand, we um, serve 30 million um, people in these developing countries. 60% um, of them um, fall within the definition of the bottom of the pyramid. They spend an average um, of five dollars per month, and uh, we are number one and num or number two in all the countries where we operate, except one. And um, we play a role. And I'm also delighted that you mentioned, you described us as freedom providers, because we believe that uh, we are making a contribution to the development of the societies in which we operate. When you ask me what are the criteria that <coughs> you take into account in order to go into one country, well, we strongly believe that there is a direct relationship between, um, between um, social responsibility and economic uh, and business. The other thing is that we strongly believe that um, telecommunications is a powerful tool for economic development. So we think that this is a win-win. This can be a win-win situation when we go into a country, make substantial capital investments, um, employ people uh, directly and indirectly, I mean, we have 7,000 employees working directly with us, but we have 300,000 points of sale, right? Um, which means that there are a lot of people that directly or indirectly is involved in the business of, of Millicom. We operate under the Tigo brand, in case uh, some of you are familiar with, with, uh, with the brand in the countries where we operate. So, um, yes, we, we play a social role. Um, we face enormous challenges. And then, because we had faced these enormous challenges, the company, our board of directors, decided to invest heavily in uh, corporate governance and compliance. Then, I joined the company one year ago. In the past year, we have created an integrity team um, consisting of now 12 members. We have defined um, an integrity strategy 
that focuses not only on compliance, on doing the right thing, but focuses on making sure that we create social value um, as a byproduct of our financial investments. So we have a strategy that consists of um, trying to create value. In order to do that, we have merged our CSR initiatives as well. So, um, and we are aligning this integrity strategy with the company strategy. Because there is no point in talking about having a business strategy and a CSR strategy that is disconnected. And in reality, our business model also facilitates this social uh, uh, thing. We are based in three, uh, we base our strategy in the AAA principle, which is affordability, availability, and accessibility. There was a lot of discussion yesterday about access and making the services affordable. And I think that we have a compromise with the societies where we operate. Um, having said that, I think I may have uh, answered your, your, your question, but I'm very happy to enter into some of the specific problems we have, because Can in the countries. But perhaps give us an example of uh, one of the problems that you've encountered. Well, I mean, um, we were talking a lot yesterday about the rule of law and working within a legality framework or not. And uh, in connection with this um, 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 uh, lawful interception, um, I'm not going to enter into the debate now, I don't think it's part of, part of the focus, but there are, I mean, we work in countries where there is no rule of law. <coughs> And it is not ourselves who are saying that, based on uh, Freedom House and many other reports. There is no effective rule of law. There is a different concept of democracy. And uh, you may have requests from um, governments, specific requests, I'm not talking about shutting down the network, but specific requests that pose to you um, a dilemma, an ethical dilemma. And the integrity team what it's trying to do is to support our, our business managers to make decisions or to resolve the ethical dilemma. Because in some instances, for example, in countries where um, um, there is the terrorism or kidnappings happen every day, if you have to wait until you have a court order that allows you to give information to the police, the individual who has been kidnapped may be killed. And then these are very difficult decisions that our business managers have to take, basically on their own. Right? What do you do? Do you facilitate information at the risk of breaching um, the, the, the privacy of the individual, individuals about whom you are giving data, or you are protecting the life value of the individual who has been kidnapped? So, so I think we've exactly touched on, on one of the key issues, which is about access to user <coughs> data. Um, it's about personally identifiable information that the telcos have massive storage databases containing. And we're talking about 30 million people's um, um, communication footprint, who they communicate with, um, um, the content of that discussion. Uh, and if we think about it in sensitive political environments, you can imagine how sensitive that information might be, including the location of a person uh, or the location of all of the people who were present at a protest. You can get all of their mobile data, who they were calling, um, and the, the conversations that they had. Mm. I think one of the things that we should talk about is that companies can't deal with this on their own. And I'm very pleased that we have a representative of the, the Swedish government here to talk about, um, and I, I'd like to invite you to talk about some of the um, considerations that you have in terms of how companies um, that are incorporated in Sweden should, should operate, how they should be dealing with some of those situations. <coughs> and indeed, as Salil pointed out, um, are there, or suggested that, um, you know, are there laws within the Swedish environment um, that should regulate the company's activities uh, in other jurisdictions? In particular, and I think I already touched on it, we've seen with Telesonora and uh, the, the reports over the last day or so. Uh, and as you know, there's a particular issue here because the Swedish government is also a 37% owner of Telesonora as well. And um, so it'd be good for you to just to, to give us some of the considerations, if not necessarily some of the answers, because I'm not sure that we're at the answer stage yet, but some of the considerations that the Swedish government um, takes into account. Let me initially state that, I mean, our expectation uh, uh, our, 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 I mean, our 
very high. I mean, where we're uh, the perception of Swedish company is um, is very good. I would say on an international basis, and we like to sustain that that their perception and image of Sweden, uh, and on you can say representing the Department of Trade on on a business sense, but on a standalone basis, it is equally important. So no doubt about that, doubt about that. I mean, uh, this. Issues origins also from uh, the guidelines and principles within the UN and the OECD organization where Sweden is a member and Sweden is a very active member, I would say, in, in general and perhaps in the field of human rights in particular. And uh, like in the OECD uh, guidelines for multilateral companies, th which were revised last year, it was a Swedish initiative that we should include a chapter about uh, internet freedom. And which also happened, and which therefore we also uh, substantially uh, finance uh, the the the, um, the UN section about global uh, compound rights, uh, global and, and 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 the guidelines uh, issued from from UN, which we are proud of. So uh, our role as a state is to initiate, adopt, I mean accept, but also support uh, Swedish company and the business itself to implement all this. And uh, also there we have a responsibility. Uh, we are, for instance, uh, have a, uh, a memorandum of standing with China and uh, regarding CSR, we have an, a certain office in, in Beijing helping the China, Chinese to implement CSR principles and so on. So, uh, so again, we're trying to be very active and we have a constant dialogue with the Swedish uh, uh, industry as well. Uh, this conference is an, is an example. And, and uh, so we are on, 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 on many, many ways uh, an important uh, player. But Lord, let me say but we are responsible to start somewhere, but also the, the, the regarding the enterprises, they also have a responsibility to, to start somewhere. So we li like to see that we are, we are uh, uh, putting the framework in place. We are supporting them to, to implement, but uh, the process itself should, as we say, should be company owned and company driven. We can't as a state that we shouldn't as a state be everywhere. I mean, this is a corporate responsibility, truly co uh, corporate responsibility, supported again with guidelines and where needed laws. And um, let me also state in, in, in what happened uh, yesterday, I was in Lithuania, so I saw it on internet, that uh, the discussion <coughs> about uh, Sonera and, uh, and there is a certain chapter in, in in the UN guideline stating there is a, a special responsibility, for, responsibility in this context for, for state-owned companies. Obviously something that is uh, we have to take very seriously and, and, and I would say that the state-owned companies should be a shining example in this field and, uh, and if not so we better do something very quickly about it. So what happened yesterday, we'll perhaps come back today, was that our um, ministry for, uh, for um, uh, the financing market. I mean, uh, uh, had a meeting with the uh, the uh, managing management and also the chairman of uh, Telesonier and discussed this issue and gave them a whole work to do and come back and report. Perhaps we'll come back to that later. But again, uh, the state's role is important, but we can't be responsible everywhere. We have to be in dialogue with with the companies. And again. I like to see every Swedish company act in a very uh, 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 comprehensive uh, way in regard of this uh, this principle. Yes, I mean one of the things that that my organisation Access has put out is a telco action plan, which tries to give telcos a framework to be able to deal with situations like this. How to respond to requests uh, for data, for instance, should it be in writing? Uh, should there be a law which authorises there to be a request for such data? Uh, who actually made the request? Uh, does the request have a connection between a particular uh, harm, I think, as Salil suggested? Is it reasonable and proportionate? There's a series of questions that I think that, um, from what I'm hearing also from Millicom, that they're looking for, and they're also looking for government guidance and support as well. In fact, what I often hear is that companies say, we really need government help. And what I hear governments often say is that companies really need to take a lead on this. And, 
And if we come back again to Salil's point is that you're not alone and that the companies are not alone. We've heard about the industry dialogue. So I think this is all part of the process. Let's move to Elaine and then we can come to you, Ben. Can I uh, just have a comment? comment to that of is course. that uh, when we meet uh, the Swedish uh, companies and we do that on a regular basis, yes, there is a tendency to that we look at them and they look at us and say, uh, and they tend to say that uh, give us uh, detailed uh, guidelines and say, hey, you are responsible for the operation. You know what happened out there, uh, and and in terms of support, you would, I mean, updated guidelines, implementation support, and perhaps speaking with, with the government of, of those states that are involved. Yes, we can do that, but again, uh, they have to what to say, um, to to realize what's 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 up to them to do, and I think they do that to uh, to to a great extent. But again, don't sit and wait for for detailed destruction for the government because they won't be issued. I mean, again, we will support in the implementation uh, process and we're doing that at the moment. But uh, please, now it's your responsibility. We have a Swedish company here. Um, so, Elaine, let's hear from you in terms of what you're hearing from the Swedish government um, and also from the International Human Rights Framework. Like what, are you getting sufficient support? Do you have sufficient guidelines to assist you in the countries in which you operate, 180. 180. I'm sure all of them from the, the, the Freedom House or the ONI index are all in, included in those 180. Um, so, so how do you feel supported and, and what are the principles that you use and, and, and are they guiding you sufficiently well in order to protect the human rights of your customers? I think um, a couple of points to, to pick up on some of the other comments, I think, starting even with the first comments around um, that the ICT sector hasn't really been working with human rights. I, I think we have actually for, for quite a long time, um, decades even, and I think maybe in our sector it, it emerged more from supply chain perspective and, and labor yeah. standards from, from that perspective. And, and now, I mean, you talk about government, NGOs, companies, everything. Five years ago, we wouldn't be sitting here having this conversation because yeah. there was no network society five years ago. You heard last night from our CEO, today it's more than six billion mobile subscriptions. And that happened over a 25 year period. But the first billion fixed lines was over 100 years. So that, you know, that's a rapid pace of change. And by the way, mobile broadband will go to 5 billion by 2015, 2016, so it gets faster and faster. And I think that is a, a fundamental challenge around the pace of technological change and, and issues, very, very complicated issues around cyber security, national security, national security, privacy, and so on. But going back to Mr. LaRue's comments last night, I mean, we are creating the plaza <laughs> where people can gather, whether it's virtually on the internet, but policy, I think there's a gap between the, the pace of technological change and, and policy. And I think that's why it's not going to be any one initiative or guideline or company or government that will solve this. That's the whole point of the the multi-stakeholder, you know, dialogue. That's why we're here. That's kind of my first point. The second one, I think there needs to be a much more um, uh, deeper understanding of the what is the ICT value chain. That would be good if you could actually explain to the audience, um, because I think there is a lack of clarity. People mm -hmm. sort of see it as the ICT sector, and there's actually a whole chain all the way from those who provide the backhaul the hardware, the mm. network operators, the, the handsets, mm. et cetera. So if you could explain that, that would be great. Yeah, and I think this will help uh, maybe to clarify a little bit uh, Ericsson's position as Don't well, be. because I, I would like to state from human rights point of view, I mean, we have been working actively with concepts around uh, sphere of influence, due diligence, and all of this since we joined uh, Business Leaders Initiative on Human Rights in 2005, 2006 timeframe. So, you know, it's not a new issue for us, but, um, the value chain, we get a lot of questions these days. Why haven't you joined GNI? Why haven't you joined the industry dialogue? And it's really about the value chain. Um, you know, GNI is, 
at this point in time, I know there's work going on looking at the telecom sector, but this is for internet companies. This is about internet censorship and principles in that area. So if you're Google, Yahoo, Microsoft, this is a very, I'm sure, relevant um, forum to have your discussions. But if you're Ericsson and you're providing network equipment, it, today, I'm saying, I know there's discussions about the future, but today this has not been the perfect fit because we are at a different place in the value chain than even Millicom or Telius Honor or any of the other operators. So, you know, you have what we call the over the top. These are the internet service providers. You have the mobile network, and then you have the telecom vendors. And so, if you don't understand uh, the role of companies in each part of the value chain and, and what we actually provide and don't provide, then it's very difficult to, to ask a company, you know, the, I just learned about your telco principles today, I look forward to reading that, but there's an awful lot of principles right now, and I think maybe we need to be a little more pragmatic and, and look on the ground yeah. and work together on... Perfect, on, yeah. perfect opportunity to, to jump into our hypothetical, because I think many of you um, are familiar with the, the country of Kablokistan. Uh, it's a country of 10 million people. Uh, it has internet penetration of, of 15%. Uh, Kablokistan has an incumbent, which is called Kablokatel, which has been there since the 50s, and they're opening up a license. So what I want to do is I want to play out this hypothetical a little bit. I want to look at some of the questions in the real sense of what actually happens. Let's start at the beginning. Let's start with an operator that is considering bidding for that operating license. Um, let's have a look at, um, um, from, from, from a perspective of, of a, a telco that's considering what are the issues, Salil, that they should be thinking about when they're deciding whether to enter the market of Kablokistan? Well, one of the things they will look at when they are going to invest is clearly the safety of bringing their capital back and the governance principles, how well the country is run, and the rule of law. But any investigation of rule of law that does not look at human rights protection is an inefficient and insufficient examination of rule of law. Because when a, com when a government can detain a person without trial, torture, make his or her dis uh, whereabouts unknown, uh, acts in that manner, the same government can very easily do the same to that company's capital. I don't want to simplify too much, but we are dealing with a hypothetical here. So when the due diligence, the way the court operates, are bankruptcy procedures fine, are the rules under which investment is allowed, when that kind of an examination takes place, if that is divorced from any examination of that country's human rights record, then the outcomes that you will get will be suboptimal. It will be sub-equilibrium status that you will get in. And you will end up making decisions thinking, oh yeah, yeah, they do de torture dissidents, but our investment will be safe. Until such a time when you're called upon to provide data down the line, or provide surveillance equipment, or have to deal with what the state calls the lawful intercept request. So let How me, will you deal with all of that? Let me pick up on this question with Bennett, because it's about investment. Yeah. It's, about sh it's about risk. Uh, I've had a number of conversations with Vodafone, for instance, and their investors, and they are asking these questions. What is the financial risk of, in, of entering into a market? What is the reputational risk? What is the legal risk? And there are legal risks because some, we've seen cases where there have been individuals who have been detained, who have been tortured, um, and the data, the information that has been used for the so-called trials has been g uh, gleaned from, from networks. Um, and from operators. So, Bennett, let's, let's un unpack this question of what are investors looking for? What sort of real due, due diligence should you be telling the, the uh, Millicom if you were an investor, for instance, uh, in, in that company? What would you be asking them to ask? Can we get some volume on Bennett's mic? Before addressing the hypothetical, I would just say that as a real world investor, I'm not sure if we've... Yeah, it's, it's not like that. Yeah. I would just say, first, as a real world investor... Uh, Check the light. I don't see your light on. 
You can talk, I'll turn it. You're being censored, I can tell. Uh, here's a network operator, can help us. Do you want to talk? Yeah, very good, thank you. Just had a little low tech moment there. Um, I would just say first. You're in Kablokistan, not Sweden. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Thank before you, getting to the hypothetical, I would just say as a real world investor, as Calvert, that we got very interested in exactly these issues half a dozen years ago as we saw a number of companies uh, in the ICT sector, but especially internet content providers uh, run into expression and, and privacy issues, not only in China, but in, very, in a lot of markets around the world. And we became very concerned uh, about the uh, ability of those kinds of companies to operate in countries with authoritarian governments that would make extraordinary demands for personal data, for example, uh, on uh, whether those companies could operate in those markets, uh, comply with those demands, which we thought violated basic human rights principles, and at the same time maintain user and customer trust and, and protect their brands. And we, right. set, we came to the conclusion very early on, it was one of the simplest analyses ever, that those circles could not all be squared, that uh, companies uh, operating, uh, particularly in the internet space, uh, had to uh, consider and make some very difficult, sensitive trade-offs among uh, international human rights standards, national law, um, the uh, legal at times, oftentimes legitimate requests of national governments of countries where they're uh, operating, but also the right to privacy and freedom of expression. And of what did you users. say to them? I mean, and what we did... said to them that these are that there are no easy answers, that there are extraordinary dilemmas, uh, and there need to be standards. But as a prelude to standards, there needs to be uh, an understanding um, that, that, be, that includes investors, but really takes place in a multi-stakeholder setting of what the different risks and issues might be. And only by determining the risks and the operational issues can the responsibilities then be defined. Now, in this hypothetical, just to be very, very brief, I would say that the first step is a basic risk assessment. And risk assessment, of course, is a common practice in the investment world on issues that have absolutely nothing to do with human rights or even rule of law, uh, of just doing a basic uh, assessment of an investment proposition in a particular comp uh, industry or country. Um, but here, there are particular tools that can be brought to bear, whether it's uh, pl classic political risk analysis, which has been a, an established discipline for several decades, uh, a more general rule of law and human rights analysis between Amnesty and Human Rights Watches, the U.S. Department of State's country reports on human rights, Freedom House, many other sources, companies can avail themselves of, I think, pretty dispassionate uh, research on human rights conditions in different companies, uh, countries. But here's the key point, is that there are, uh, there is now, uh, a growing body of work of human rights risk assessment uh, for companies. And this is a movement which got going first in extractives, uh, oil, gas, and mining, and has developed over the years and then gained the imprimatur of Professor Ruggie and his mandate in highlighting the utility of, uh, of risk assessment. So that's where I would so let start. Me ask, let me ask you in particular and perhaps give you a few more yep. additional pieces of yep. information in the hypothetical. Actually, Kablokistan is in the bottom 10 of the yep. Freedom House Index. Um, we know for a fact that they are filtering the internet uh, for political purposes. We also know that in Kablokistan, the minister is surveying the networks. This is information that a company who is interested 
in investing, in entering into that market, is aware of. You're, you are an investor in that company. You're also aware, and here's a third factor, that in the operating licence that they would sign, that they would be required to shut down the network when there are natural disasters or disturbances. Right. So, classic dilemmas here. Uh, and let's just say that there are three possible responses a company could take. One would be to make the determination that it's in the business interest of the company to operate in that market and to comply with, that, uh, with national laws, however interpreted and applied by that government, whatever the underlying human rights uh, issues may be. Uh, and to just <laughs> just deal with it. You know, we're there, we're here in business, and yeah. we're going to deal with it. Let's, let's run through them briefly, because I want to yeah. get a response, yeah. and then so I that's also want to go to the audience that's as one, well. That's I one extreme. People... The other extreme is to make a determination that the human rights situation is so poor, rule of law is so weak, governance is so bad, reputation risks to the company are, are so high, that the company will not enter in or operate in the market. I actually think that that's a courageous decision. Uh, when it's made, it's rarely made. I'd like to see it made more. The middle ground, which I do think is reasonable, provided that it's based on a clear assessment of risk and a, an acceptance of responsibility, is to try to negotiate with the government uh, certain processes and procedures of what the company would be willing to do and not to do and try to establish that on a contractual basis. The other part of that would be for the company to align with one of the standards we've discussed. It's uh, <laughs> parent with users and citizens, users globally, citizens, users, netizens in that country about what the company may be filtering, for example. And there are examples of that practice. So that's a, a big gray area, and I don't want to label it as being wrong. I think that it's an okay. area that and GNI provides for that. So let's <clears throat> assume in the hypothetical that we have that contract. Yep that we understand now that there's not going to be political filtering, that there's going to be warrantless requests for data. Let's, let's turn to you and hear what you think should be the next steps and yes. perhaps what happens if in the middle of that contract with a government which isn't necessarily democratically elected, which doesn't necessarily have the rule of law, for whom contractual law doesn't necessarily mean uh, that there will be compliance or uh, contractual obligations met. Well, I think that... Uh, mm, I would like to address the convenience or not for a company like Millicom to invest in that country. Mm -hmm. And I, I would follow uh, Bennett's recommendations, and I think that the human rights aspect would be one of the elements of our risk assessment. Because of the beliefs I mentioned at the beginning, I think that the citizens of that country would be better off by having a company um, like us in the country. Okay. Because we can bring, we can help them develop, and we can help them protect their uh, rights apart from providing access to a number of services, not only in, in, in the telecommunications, but also in banking, health, etc., etc. et cetera. Um, so I think that the first element would be, yes, we would look into that country, despite the freedom um, of expression risk. Then um, we have embraced the United Nations Global Compact Principles, and we um, welcome the guiding principles on business and human rights. Um, in order to expand on and, and try to put in place some specific actions, we have started, we are part of this industry dialogue. I'm privileged to work with Milka Pietikainen, who started uh, the dialogue when she was at NSN, and um, now she's working with us. The uh, dialogue, um, and there is going to be a session, side session in a few minutes, um, on, on, the, on the industry dialogue, um, pretends that operators and, and uh, <coughs> infrastructure providers get together and discuss principles, discuss tools, and discuss ways to um, influence um, or to resolve specific situations that we face. In, in, the, in the specific example, going back to your point, and, and in connection with uh, uh, previous comment about companies having the responsibility to do, 
uh, things. We, we fully agree that uh, it is the responsibility of, of uh, companies. Companies have a responsibility to respect human rights, but we cannot do it on our own. Mm. Right? And then when we face a situation of a potential violation of uh, freedom of expression, we would expect to have the support of our host governments to help us communicate to the home government, um, sorry, the other way around. Mm -hmm. We understand. To our home governments to, to help us influence the host government that what they are proposing to do is in breach of ac internationally accepted standards. So because let's, let's in, 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 uh, just, just minute, to finish up. In, yeah. in one civil situation <laughs> where we have somebody coming from the regulator of the government to our office, talking to the general manager, asking us to do something, right? Um, we apply our protocol. Have you identified the individual? Does he have powers to do this? Is he mentioning a, a legal requirement? The guy on the phone is telling me, Enrique, you don't understand. This guy is the head of the Secret Service. I don't need to I, ask him to identify. I know very well who he is. And if I don't do what he's asking me to do, I'm on a plane tonight. Yeah. Right? So we have this issue of staff safety. And I think it's an important issue if you think about uh, with Vodafone in Egypt, for instance, it was a gun to the head kind of situation, reportedly. Um, uh, so often I think this issue of staff safety might trump some of the questions that we ask. You know, is it properly constituted? Uh, is it in writing? And does it comply with local law? Uh, is it reasonable and proportionate? Uh, but let's just hear from Salil in response to uh, the company actually entering into the market. And now let's just add another piece, which is that the political situation is actually becoming more tense. And so the president needs to have real-time psychographic um, um, data of the opposition. They want to know who. They want to know who they're friends with, they want to know who they're connected with, and they want to know when the next protest is. Okay. so. There were three things I wanted to respond to. I want to respond to the staff safety issue and this dilemma. So let's and look then at when, and then the when final you're done, dilemma I promise first. You will come to the no, let's look the at the audience. final point first. That the president wants to know all this um, sensational data, which is nice. But my answer would be that the company should not be in a position, should never have been in a position when it is a surprise for them that the president is capable of making such requests. If the company had done proper human rights due diligence, it would have known way before, before it even knew that Kerblokistan existed on the map, that this is the kind of government it is. Governments that turn authoritarian don't turn overnight. There are tendencies, there are reports, there are, there are arguments about it, there are warnings posted alongside. So if the company can't simply say, oh, we were there, we thought it was like Sweden or Norway, and suddenly we found it was Kerblokistan. It's never that, it's never that. That's the first point I wanted to make. About staff safety, again, it's something similar, that if the assessment was done properly, then the company would have known that we are in a country where the rule of law is arbitrary, where the state security force can turn up with guns and demand whatever it is that they want. Do you want to be in such a situation? That's the choice that the company has to make. There may not be a law about it, and there should not be perhaps a law about it where a company should operate, unless there are uh, UN sanctions in place. In that sort of a situation, what is the company to do? It has to, therefore, make that assessment so rigorous and so robust as to be able to anticipate that there may be really bad red lines which we may have to cross in this country. And if so, maybe it is not a smart thing for us to do, particularly if you're carrying a Scandinavian flag or a Western democracy flag or whatever it is. That's something worth bearing in mind. A Couple of other points. The warning sign that came up for me in the scenario that you were laying out was when you used the word natural disaster. When you said that in the context of natural disaster, a network can be switched off. And I just thought, how silly can that be for a government to demand that? In fact, when there's a natural disaster, it should unjam its defense frequencies and get more capacity so that people can identify and get in touch with their loved ones who might, because the towers might have collapsed and there has to be some other capacity to be in place. Red Cross would need those frequencies. So in fact, what I would want to see is that why does the government place such a condition in the investment scenario. And one final point is about going to a country and saying that we go because, and this is not to pick on you, or not on Global Compact, but Global Compact principle too clearly says don't be complicit. 
Now, if you look at the kind of scenario the country says, the risk of being complicit is so high that if the company is a global compact adherent, it would really want to know why. And it's not simply a question of if we don't do it, somebody else will. Because, or if we are there, it's good we are there because we adhere to all these principles. I'll give an example from the oil industry. When the war was going on between North and South Sudan, or rather within Sudan at that time, one large oil company was providing aviation fuel to the Sudanese Air Force. What was the Air Force doing? It was going to the south, bombing places. People were having to flee to Uganda and Kenya as refugees. The ground would get cleared up, and people were able to explore for oil in that area. At that time, if I were in a village, and my village was going bombed, would I feel better that the company that provided aviation fuel has signed a global compact? No. It's irrelevant. That's okay. my point here. So, perfect. Perfect opportunity to to um, get some questions from the audience. And uh, I think what, we've, what is increasingly clear is just the complexity here, that there are no simple answers, that sometimes you find yourself in markets in which, in where you're being asked uh, to be complicit or uh, have a direct involvement in the abuse of rights. Uh, and sometimes, as Salil uh, pointed out, you should have known before you entered into that market that this is a likely scenario. I'm also glad that you, you, you raised the issue of, of um, armaments as well, or at least um, the, the, supply, the, the support for armaments in the form of oil. Um, many people are saying that surveillance technology, for instance, yeah. should be treated in the same way yeah. as guns. Uh, or, or other forms of, of small arms. So let's move to, um, to the, to the audience. Ah, one, one last comment, excuse me if I yeah. allow you to. Um, yeah, uh, just in context to do this debate, let me just, uh, surprisingly I'm not, I've not been a state secretary my whole life. I was actually, one capacity I hold, I was responsible for in Vattenfall for financing all their uh, uh, investment outside Europe, and so we've been invested in, in hydropower <coughs> stations in Laos, in Bolivia, and so on. And what you're talking about, our risk assessment, certainly was my daily business at that time. And especially in, in that field, I mean, if you build a hydropower station, it will be in operation for 100 years. And if there's something happened, you just don't pack your bags and move it. Right. I mean, it will be there. So that was extremely important to do your homework. So, uh, and then it's not only risk identification, also risk, I would say, elimination. And it also start, for instance, who's going to be your partner? I mean, you team up with, with other guys that could, could have, make, have a greater impact on that certain country. We teamed up with the Americans, for instance, in, in Latin yep. America, which made sense. In terms of financing, well, there, what type of institution do you use? Multilateral bank, you use a, a, dev a development bank, export credit agencies, state controlled, state uh, uh, supported, and in terms of the Swedish export credit agencies, yes, they have guidelines from, 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 from us stating that they should be extremely um, careful in terms of uh, um, um, what we discussed and, 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 and uh, corporate social responsibility that is in the guideline from us. That's also we are a member in, in the Asian Development Bank, African Development, yeah. and we, we support them and they have their guideline. And these forms a network that if homework is probably done in terms of risk uh, analyze and risk elimination, well, you're not that what is a uh, naked out there? I mean, you're pretty well I, dressed. It's, that's important, absolutely essential. Yeah. I want to think about this from the perspective of the user. And, and Salil, thank you very much for, like, you can belong to the best compacts in the world, but if your village is being bombed, or your network is being compromised, or your conversation is being surveilled and you end up in prison. This is what we're talking about now, is about where the rubber hits the road. No more comments from the panel. <laughs> I've got a question up here from a lady over here uh, and then uh, and a gentleman down here. Could I please request that you have about 90 seconds maximum to either make a comment or a question, if that's okay, because there are a number of people who want to speak. Thank you very much. My name is David Isaacs, and I'm a global reporting here in Sweden. Now, two comments. Uh, Gunnar Oms, uh, two questions, I'll put them sharp. Gunnar Oms from the Ministry of uh, foreign, foreign Trade in Sweden. Uh, your, your minister, uh, she was very much involved in the, tr in, in the attempt to sell civilian equipment to Libya in 2010. 
and you were, I, don't, I think, don't think you were Secretary of State at that time, but my question to you, would you be involved in the same sort of business today with Bahrain, Saudi Arabia or any other countries? Uh, is that sort of business you will continue to do from your own perspective, from the morale perspective? Uh, I would like to ask uh, Millicom, are you, we saw the program uh, on the Swedish television yesterday about how Telia Sonora, your competitor, is cooperating with Belarus KGB and other, other uh, se secret service companies. You were talking about kidnapping this or that, but to be sharp, are you having the same sort of practice, the same sort of cooperation as uh, Telia Sonora has with, with uh, surveillance equipment, with, with this sort of uh, services you. like KGB in uh, countries where you are operating? I'm going to take you. the second question from this lady over here. We can get the microphone to her, please. Okay, if you can just keep it short and sweet, that would be great. The comment. Um I, I think structure follows strategy, and I know of very few companies that have, A, more than one person looking at CSR, let alone human rights, and almost none of them have a board person responsible. But here's my question to you. Why don't more companies say to governments, there is no scientific and technological progress without freedom of uh, speech and privacy rights, right, property rights? Uh, your right to control your property, and that's yeah. your... Okay, so all that, why don't they make a business case for it more often? So that's my question, okay. and people could respond. Thank Great. you. Great. Okay. Uh, let me get a response from these two questions, and then I'll come to you. Uh, Gunnar, would you like to respond? Yeah. To, um, in particular to this? Sure, sure. I mean, uh, one of my role in, in the ministry is to lead Swedish industry delegation out in the world. Next week I will be in Kazakhstan, for instance. And uh, we think that is vital. We think uh, that trade makes a difference. We think uh, trade is an Im important component in terms of changing the world. And we support Swedish investment. And of course, we do not uh, support either equipment or investment that is not in, in guidelines with our export gu uh, guidelines or uh, the UN uh, regulations and so on. And the specific item, namely the, the, the trip to Libya a couple of years ago, you should be very much aware of, and hopefully you are aware of, that that what uh, that company discussed uh, was nothing that was presented before for, for the minister herself. So that was an equal surprise to her, like everybody else, what what they brought up. And uh, the lesson to learn that that uh, before every industry delegation, we meet with the, with the with, with the, the the participating companies in order to find out what are they going to promote and, and, and to whom are they going to make a business so we can understand for ourselves is this, uh, well, it, does this make sense or not? So, okay. But again, being uh, heading an uh, industry delegation in tough markets is, uh, is, an, is, an, is an objective and is a role of mine and I think it makes sense. Okay. Did you want to respond to either of the questions? Well, I, I would say I can uh, not comment on, on the issues our competitors are facing, but uh, definitely these are things that uh, I expect to discuss at the industry dialogue level to make sure that whatever things may have happened uh, are resolved uh, soon, trying to engage with whatever stakeholders we need to engage. Uh, still, on the, on the hypothetical case in connection with uh, Salil's comments and other comments, as a citizen of the hypothetical country, I would feel better or more protected if companies like Millicom, where, uh, who are accountable for, to shareholders, um, accountable to a number of other stakeholders, are present in that country, even if there is a risk of human rights violations in connection with freedom of expression, uh, than otherwise. Because if, if the alternative is that international or multinational uh, companies should not enter countries where there are these kind of risks, we are going to leave um, the citizens in the hands of the incumbent that happens to be controlled by the repressive government. So I think that considering all the other business risks, um, I would still be better off um, as a citizen thinking that I'm, there is somebody who is accountable to other stakeholders who is uh, present there. Just 30 seconds on this. Sorry, yeah, just 30 seconds. I don't know if Michael is in the room, Michael Ante, and I shouldn't speak. Oh, you are here. I mean, one of the examples I remember, maybe I read it wrong at the time of your problem, that you chose to go for the Microsoft blogging 
network because you thought that because it was a Western and American company, there'll be better protection of your identity than a Chinese partner. And yet the company failed. So all my point about raising, and Michael can tell his story eloquently and brilliantly. I shouldn't do that. But, but in his case, what happened at that time in 2004 and 2005 in China, that he did trust the international company and that company failed. That's my point, yeah. Uh, Elaine, could you just perhaps respond to this question about the economic argument of an open network? And are these some of the discussions that you're having about the, the we've, we heard yesterday, the 1% increase in, in penetration uh, or mobile coverage results in an X percentage increase in GDP? Is this a relevant argument? Yeah, and does I, it I, I liked that question actually because um, that actually is our core business. Our core business is about, you know, even right. we used to talk a few years ago about the next billion mobile subscribers. Now we talk about the last billion. And, you yeah. know, with those billions have come in market after market, you know, proven social and economic benefits. But I want to also comment on the hypothetical a little bit in terms of just a, cu a couple of fundamentals. There's been questions about, you know, the, the network going down and so on. I think just a couple of things for the audience to think about. The whole principle of a mobile network is that the network can find you. The whole that right. is the concept of mobility, that wherever you are in the world, someone can call you and they can find you. Because right. you could have international roaming and, and other issues, but, but that is you know, the fundamental principle. Another fundamental principle of telecom is five nines. 99.999% of the time, the network should be functioning. Yeah. That's the business. And if the network goes down, it's a lot of money being lost. A third, um, there's a lot of discussion about surveillance. You know, every network, according to international standards, needs to account for lawful intercept to fight crime, to make sure that you're, if you're in an emergency, that they can find you. Now, the, the line is where you cross if um, that, is, that type of functionality is misused. Right. That, is a, that is the delicate line. But as a company, I think one thing the new UN principles bring and some of the other initiatives is the um, open discussion about due diligence. And, and we know, in, for us, we don't have new countries that we go into. We've been in many markets for more than 100 years already, and the regimes come and go. <laughs> but still, our basic principle, our basic core business is about providing communication. But we have taken other decisions in consideration of due diligence. We do not provide surveillance technology. That's why certain sanctions don't apply to us. We're providing standard GSM equipment, 3G, 4G, all over the world. And as a company, you have to decide about the products you sell, about the markets you're in, and about who you choose to do business with. Those are the three core issues uh, for due diligence. Yep. Thank you very much. Uh, nice and brief, please, if that's okay, because I have literally a sea of hands. Sir, please. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I must say, when we come here, we are not coming here to only ask questions. We also make comments. So I, I'll no, no, that's fine. But I'm just saying that okay. there's a limited okay. amount of okay. time, okay. and a I number, just wanted, so, I just wanted to and say a number that, of other people who want okay. to speak. I just wanted to say Thank that um, some of the core challenges that I, I see as a professor is that there is um, compatibility between the corporate uh, aims and objectives. The corporate business is whether it's an investor or not is to make profit. And there are also organizations whose core business is about people. So the point is trying to strike a balance between the profit motive of corporations, whether it's IT or anything else, and at the same time to incorporate corporate social responsibility so that they are part of society and therefore contribute to the, improving, to the improvement of the living condition of the people. So what I see here in our discussion is, you're talking about human rights. I also teach human rights. But I think the issue is not yet properly addressed. Uh, I teach at the university where there is no right to information, to knowledge. A lot of digital uh, information is kept, is, is commercialized. So in fact, you cannot, you cannot get free education. Yeah. And that implies the right to education is also violated. So how do we strike a balance between the right to information, the right to knowledge, between is a digital uh, knowledge, as well as the right to pr privacy, the right for companies to make profit. So I think we need to make uh, uh, a strategy. And the only way strategy <coughs> that I think would be workable is to redefine 
the role of the state to redefine and restructure the role of companies, which would include corporate social responsibility beyond making slogans, and also enhance the role of civil society so that the three of them, the three of them can negotiate, can strategize, and come up with a fair world. Thank you. Uh, I think I, I, I would have liked to, take, uh, to say many things, but... Okay. I think that's a... It's okay, a, thank a, you, it's a wonderful intervention because I feel like actually we're part of that process. Uh, I have a question here, here, and then the gentleman there. Um, if we could just get the questions in rapid fire and then sure. we can also get my a response. My name is Mohammed Al Abdullah, I'm from Syria, and my question directed to Ms. Elan about Ericsson working in Syria. You just said in your last line, we have to be careful about the market we're entering, and we, uh, if the information or if the technology was uh, misused in, in the countries we're working. And here's, I'm, re I'm reading from Radio Sweden, it's an article in November 25th, saying the Swedish telecom giant Ericsson is supplying the Syrian regime with mobile phone technologies that makes it possible to follow what the opposition there does, reports Swedish television. And in Ericsson's response in the article saying, Ericsson says it cannot be responsible if its technology is misused. I would go with the, bad, with the good willing, and I know, I see, you're not supplying them with the bad technologies, you're supplying only the good thing, but everybody, almost 100% certain, the Syrian government using this technology to track people and assassinate them, not only arrest them. And there's 13,000 people get killed, and there's crimes against the humanity reported by the UN Human Rights Council in the three and four special sessions in Syria. And you're still in that market. And who's responsible at some point if your products got misused because some, somebody is responsible and your line was in the article, we cannot hold responsible if our products get misused. Thank you. Thank you. Elaine, we'll, we'll ask you to respond to that. Sir, behind. Can I get the, the mic in the back? Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Carlos Dada and I come from El Salvador. And I'm a journalist, and I want to ask a question to a representative from Millicom. Uh, because my colleague just made you a question about your company, not about your competitor, but you didn't answer it. Uh, I heard you saying that sometimes, because it's a matter of, of life or death, uh, you can't wait for a justice court order. So you just decide with your people when to break the law to give information away to governments. Uh, you're a private company. Uh, promoting human rights means uh, helping consolidate institutions and the rule of law. I'm just wondering how many times your managers have given away information to governments because they thought it was the proper thing to do. My question is, how many people, political activists, uh, journalists, are being surveilled because one of your managers resolved the ethical dilemma, as you call it, uh, in a way more convenient to a government than to the journalist. Thank, thank you. Thank you, sir. T two very challenging questions, and, and thank you for um, you know, being so honest and, and um, articulate in, in those questions. Um, we'll get a third here, and then we'll get a response from the panel. Thank you. I'm Yusuf Sheri from Tunis, Tunisia. Um, you know, you were talking about um, the, um, you're helping social business, helping banking, etc., uh, and improving the life of people in these countries. But this is like soldiers drawing hearts and flowers on a nuclear bomb. The, you, I mean, th when you are in these countries, and yesterday we talked about the SMSC, that UN conference on freedom um, in 2005. When you go to these countries, you're offering them legitimacy and they use you in their propaganda for years. I mean, until 2010, our dictatorship in Tunisia used to talk about that conference, used to talk about these uh, heads of uh, <coughs> big companies coming to our country, showing that this is great, and uh, you know, opposition is saying false things while we are uh, helping uh, to improve technology, etc. So you're giving legitimacy to these countries, and I think that uh, your government should uh, more or less help you to, you know, to overcome this, because you're really giving legitimacy to dictatorships. Thank you. Uh, I'm not sure if well, I got, was there a specific question there? No, this is just a remark, because by going to these countries, you're giving them legitimacy. Okay. Um, just a remark. Thank you. Um, I've just had our boss uh, advise that we're able to extend this discussion by further 10 minutes, so.
Uh, Elaine, would you like to? Yeah, I'm, I'm actually really um, pleased to have that question. And um, I will start by saying the situation in Syria is um, an extremely um, complicated one, uh, humanitarian. We are deeply concerned about the humanitarian situation in Syria. In fact, we are talking about it in Ericsson basically every day. And uh, I think this is a, a perfect example of um, a fundamental dilemma because um, from my perspective working um, for many years with human rights issues, I, I would you know, like to also pose the question, um, will the humanitarian or human rights situation in Syria improve if companies like Ericsson are, are leaving that market? And I know that wasn't your question and I'm going to comment on what you said, but, but this is a a broader issue for the, for the 10 million subscribers in Syria. And in the case of Syria, I, I would like to um, correct something that has been falsely reported in the media. And that is that Ericsson has provided surveillance equipment to the regime of Syria. We have not provided um, surveillance equipment to the regime in Syria. We never have, and to my knowledge, we never will. We have provided standard GSM equipment in our uh, very strong belief is that um, people in Syria having the ability to, I mean, this is what the whole Arab Spring is about, right? If you have the ability to communicate, we heard the story, I forget who gave it yesterday, from 1982, um, abuses that happened in the Balkans, and it took 25 years to get that information out. That, that doesn't happen anymore with cell phones. And so, um, I guess my, my point is that we, we did not provide surveillance equipment to the regime. We will not. And the fundamental dilemma, you know, the sanctions, because the sanctions were targeted against surveillance equipment, and since we did not provide surveillance equipment, the sanctions did not apply to us. So therefore, we are, we are still in that market. Yep. Could, could I, could I, yeah, my Please. question was, you have a 60 employers working in Syria, and they're working for the STE, the governmental body, which is responsible for monitoring people. I'm not suggesting by any way Ericsson doing that work, but you're doing a work, helping agency, is targeting and identifying people and assassinating them in systematic basis. And this suggestion or response saying, if we don't provide this technology somebody else, that doesn't work. Are you happy and proud to be in that market? That's Actually, one point. And the second question is, the sanction got vetoed only by the Swedish government. The, v the, the EU uh, package of sanctions got vetoed by the Swedish government, and lots of people suggesting the Swedish government vetoed the package of sanctions only to protect Ericsson and to allow them keep working in Syria. And if I get to respond directly to the point, please, about keep going inside Syria, working, having employers working for the STE, governmental body, and even the private uh, cell phone companies, it's not private, and everybody knows this. It's owned by the cousin of the president, and he's the first member of the president family sanctioned by the US and the EU. So saying it's private companies, and we're working there, and if, if we don't leave the situation, if the human rights situation is not going to be better, doesn't really solve the case. And who's responsible if your products got misused? Because in the article, Ericsson representatives say, we are not responsible. And that's a question for the panel, the entire panel. When the a product of good technology misused by a dictatorship government. Who is responsible? Thank you. Can I, can I, can I, can I, suggest, can I suggest that we have one more response from Ericsson mm. on that? I think this conversation is extremely important. I'm so glad that you two are now face to face with each other. <laughs> and hopefully, we talked last night as well. <laughs> and I think there'll be many more conversations. Yeah. But I Elaine, you say that, that the yeah. Ericsson board is, and staff are talking about this every day. Yeah. The, um, the comments about the, the Swedish government, I, I will defer to the Swedish government since they're actually on the panel. Uh, but. Uh, uh, the comment on um, employees in the region, yes, we have employees in the region. Our employees are um, not working uh, directly for the, the regime. In fact, they're working for Ericsson as they are Ericsson employees. And I think um, what I can say is the sanctions that you refer to that are applying to different businessmen or, or companies and individuals in Syria, those sanctions, of course, we are strictly uh, um, adhering to. So, um, 
In terms of if we will leave Syria, right now our decision, which is taken at a very high level in the company, is, is actually not to abandon Syria and, and the people and the mobile subscribers in Syria. So. Maybe it would be interesting to take a poll in Syria of Ericsson customers or people who use Ericsson to see whether they would like Ericsson to leave or not, um, if we're thinking about the user. Uh, can I get a response from, from uh, Gwena uh, in relation to this question about, uh, about the sanctions and the vetoing of sanctions? Uh, and then we'll get a response from you. And Silila, I'll also ask you to join. Yeah, yeah just, I mean, just briefly, uh, if it's, it's okay. correct that uh, we uh, did not support the initial uh, uh, sanction suggestion from EU because we, we thought and we still think that an operational mobile network is more to the advantage to the people than the government and that is something that the Arabic Spring clearly demonstrated. I've been in Libya and Tunisia uh, uh, just a couple of months ago and found out for myself and talked to a lot of people what the importance of an operational network. So the sanction was not uh, to components to keep the networks ongoing from Ericsson. It is the sanction are for surveillance uh, equipment and, and uh, software that, that uh, obviously is a misuse of, of, of the system. So yes, uh, we thought it was counterproductive, uh, the initial proposal from EU. And we talked about it and they changed their mind and I'm glad that, that happened. Okay, so I think you two are also face-to-face, -face, so I think that <laughs> conversation can, can happen offline. Yeah, thank you. Well, I think that that question clearly illustrates the, the nature of the problem, the complexity of the issue. And I'm convinced that when the board of directors of Millicom decided two years ago that we needed a strong compliance function, they were having questions like this in mind. Right? What can we do to make sure that we apply international standards that are different and higher to the standards that we are applying in the, in the countries where we operate. Right? My ultimate goal and my definition of success for the integrity team would be to disappear. Right? We will disappear the moment everybody knows how to address these ethical dilemmas. Right? So the idea now is not to go and try and find what happened in the past, is to try and make sure that we do things that are right. Because it is difficult to define what is right and what is wrong, we are entering into a dialogue with peers in the industry and um, a telecoms uh, networks providers so that we can give a common response to these things, right? Do we have answers? No, we don't. We are trying to create tools, we are uh, trying to develop guidelines, and we are trying to, get to, t to take collective action to address these specific problems. Because it is true. I mean, we don't know what our employees have done in the past. Did they have guidance? Did they have an understanding that what they were doing was wrong? Right? Somebody has to tell them. So we are here, part of our strategy consists of education. Drafting policies educate our people. As part of our, our strategy, uh, integrity strategy, we are engaging in a huge stakeholder engagement uh, exercise to try and understand what our shareholders expect from us, but what society, civil society expects from us, what our employees expect from us, what our suppliers expect from us, what governments expect from us. Right? And yeah. then I'm sure that if we have this conversation next year, I will be able to give you more specific examples as to what we are specifically doing to prevent Kay. things that might have happened in the past. L let me jump in there. I'm glad that you two are also face to face <laughs> because I think that that conversation should not happen next year. One of the reasons why Access, my organization, put on the Silicon Valley Human Rights Conference was to bring people on the front line together with people who are making decisions. When you make a decision in Silicon Valley, this is what it means for us in Damascus. When you make a decision in Palo Alto, this is what it means for us in Tunis. And I think that that direct dialogue is essential because you, they need, these guys who are dis, decision makers, who are making the decisions that impact the user, need to hear directly from those individuals. Um, okay, so we have a few questions over here. There's a gentleman with the microphone, if we can keep it brief. And then... Thank you. Yep. Who else has the microphone? Sorry, I can't see. And there's a lady behind. Uh, my name is Hans Rosén. I'm a journalist at the Swedish Daily Dagens Nyheter. I have a question for Elaine Weidman. In connection to the comments made by the Syrian gentleman before, um, many people say that transparency is critical in if you want to move the, the process of protecting human rights on the internet uh, forward. 
And from time to time, we have these discussions about uh, Ericsson's products. Um, you have referred yourself to Syria. Uh, and uh, there's always these questions about what can things be used for. Um, so my first question uh, to you is, uh, could Ericsson do anything better to be more transparent and speak out more clearly? What kind of equipment do you provide? What could it be used for and what is it uh, practically used for? Thank you. Uh, second question is, uh, you have said several times now that Ericsson does not provide surveil surveillance technology. Uh, but uh, on the other hand, uh, Ericsson's networks can be used for surveillance. I would like you to define what you mean when you say surveillance technology. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. Can I get a comment from the lady behind? If you could keep it brief, please, because I have yes. a, a few more comments that I'd like to get from the floor. Sure. Um, hello, I'm Sophia from Cambodian Center for Human Rights, and I'm also the contributing author for Global Wide Online. Um, my, um, my, my question um, concerned to the earlier comment of the panelists that say that a company is not alone, and we can, um, the company can join together for the right course. But my question is that, um, what is the motive for those companies to join together for that course if it is not benefit them and it challenge to, the, to their company when they operate in a fair state or in, uh, in a state that are corrupt and their choice should be um, to stay in, in the market rather than corporate. And secondly, um, what, what should be um, uh, what, what should we as the end user do if those companies to, um, choose not to join together to, to protect the rights but to cooperate with the government who violate the rights? Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And there's one more comment here. Just there. Yeah, there's a lady with her hand up. Thank you. My name is Kiteria from Youth Parliament of Mozambique. Uh, my question is, uh, how do the companies define that there is an autocratic market in one country? Because many times we see that, especially in developing countries, companies do not pay attention to oppression of people in internet while there is no revolution. So only after revolution is that countries really help, companies really help and take uh, and help people because many times they are, they are in partnership with governments that are oppressing people and we have an example in Mozambique that uh, one month ago uh, students with scholarship in Algeria demonstrated pacifically using internet and then as a result governments said used companies to discover who are the leaders of this demonstration and said, decide to repatri <coughs> repatriate to Mozambique all the leaders of the uh, demonstration and asked all other students that are dead, more than 100 students, to sign a declaration that they say that they will never again demonstrate, even pacifically, that are in constitution, and they will never involve themselves in comments against the government or criticize the government, uh, advocates for rights. And this is a way, new ways to silent people, to persecute people. So how the company really define where the countries were that how oppressing uh, are really so oppressing th before there is a revolution. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think that that might be the, the last question because I'm getting very stern looks from from people here, including from the digital curatorial team who I haven't asked once. So I will ask. Can you okay. sum up 500 tweets in... in um, I think there's been more than 500 tweets, but... Um, I, I'm I'll, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> no, apologies to, no, I don't know. to the Twitter sphere. Uh, no, but it, it's... I, I think that the issues have actually been covered quite nicely by the, by the crowd, so hopefully yeah. they're reflective. Yeah, I think so too, but um, I got one question that might sum up this question, the discussion a little bit. And, um, that is, there are national laws and universal human rights. Which one are you going to adhere to? Okay. So let's finish off with that question. Salil. Okay, all right. So I, I noticed two questions which were relevant, and the last one I'll take a stab at. Uh, the question was about 
I think the, the, our friend from Cambodia asked about the comment I made about that companies are not alone, and she wanted to know what the motive is of companies, if I got it right. And if I were to put it very honestly, frankly, to me, the motive doesn't matter. It may be reputational. It may be to prevent a legal risk. It may be to avoid a boycott. It may be because of the fine feelings with which the CEO gets up every morning. It doesn't matter so long as the impact and effect of it is positive for human rights. If that is the case, frankly, it doesn't matter what led the company to do it. It would be great if the company thought of itself as a human rights defender, but it is not designed for that purpose. We are all aware of that. They perform a very legitimate function as profit-making entities. Profits are not illegal. They are legal. Unless there are profits, there can't be taxes. Unless there are taxes, there can't be many of the benefits we want. So, so that's, not the, that's not the philosophical discussion so that I'm too worried about. You'll have to just speak quicker, I mean, shorter than that. Shorter I need than to get that. Okay. The, just okay, so that's about the motive part of it. The other question was about... Uh, national versus international. The national okay. versus international law. Very simple, glib response, but an honest response, choose a better one. If a state does have better standards for human rights than the international standards, go with that. If the international standards are superior, cajole the state, work with the state, and be a friend of the people to make sure that you're a corporate citizen in a, in a country means that you're a citizen with the people and not a partner of the government alone. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I would like to, to, to address the, the, the last question. Our, our position is very clear. Uh, we go beyond the law. Uh, again, provided that the standard, uh, um, <coughs> the standard, the local standard is not higher, which does not tend to be the case in the countries where we operate. We operate in countries that don't have privacy laws, don't have competition laws, that probably allow children to work at a very young age, which we are not ne necessarily happy to, to, and we are imposing our own standards about it. So definitely the, the, the answer is very clear for us. We are adopting European standards, actually what we have defined internally is that we will follow Swedish standards. Mm -hmm. right? And then the, the nice thing about our job is that in a way we are creating the law, our own law, yeah. the law of the company. So I think that one thing to reflect upon the scene that we've brought up the issue of Swedish law is that we have been talking about worst case scenarios with Kerblokistan, etc. And many of the comments from the crowd have been from individuals and I didn't hand pick them, I just chose the hands. Um, uh, from countries in which there are human rights abuses taking place. But I think many of the telcos and the internet companies will tell you that actually many of the requests for data and for censorship are coming from Western democracies. I think that there are equal issues here in the West as there are overseas, um, and that uh, home countries and governments need to be consistent. They need to be consistent with the laws that they're passing in their parliaments and in their congresses and that are being proposed by congressmen and by members of parliament and by parliamentarians. So let's think about that as an equal playing field where the principles are the same no matter which jurisdiction uh, in which you're operating. You're right, we, we're unfortunately not living in a perfect world and, and again we're trying to support as much as we can from Swedish perspective wherever where we are in any and, and situation and and the, the discussion here today has been I mean about the complex word and and the balance you have to take where, where you go uh, but let me just state that I mean uh, human rights are universal and and they are right on a standalone basis and they should never never be violated from business purposes and other purpose so again they should be respected and in, if you come in conflict I mean I mean, uh, this is, uh, uh, what I say, a uh, higher human rights are on a higher standard and, and again should never be violated. Thank you. Elaine? I think um, a lot of the questions that were raised, uh, there were maybe too many to, to respond on each one, but um, highlight the complexity of the technological world that we're living in. And, and as I stated earlier in my, my remarks, understanding the, the value chain is really important to for, for all uh, stakeholders, whether it's uh, government, industry, NGOs, civil society, to understand where things happen in the value chain so that uh, you get a factual uh, representation. And I think on the question of um, transparency, I'm sure that there are uh, ways to always improve on, on transparency and on, on the way issues are handled. So that's something that we 
we work with every day, but it's complex and I think that was the benefit of, of this conference uh, for me individually yeah. to be part of this uh, multi-stakeholder yeah. process. And, and I, I would like to echo that. I think that, um, and we're about to close, but to, to, to actually thank the, the, the companies, uh, the investors, the human rights expert, the government for actually having this honest um, and frank discussion about some of the issues that are being faced on the ground. Let's have the final yeah. comment from Bennett. Is this on? You're okay. on. Look, you know, I made a comment at the outset that I felt that in some respects on, on human rights issues, and I really meant with uh, respect to freedom of expression and right to privacy, that uh, this sector is behind some other sectors. I still feel that way, but I do feel very strongly that the uh, quickening of events, um, the accumulation of events, not least uh, the issues that were highlighted in this country yesterday and today will compel, should compel, I think will compel uh, this sector, whether it needs, to, whether you agree with me or not, that it needs to catch up, will, there will be much more work to be done here. And I just do want to come back to what the minister said earlier about the trade-off, if you will, between government policy and, and corporate responsibility. Uh, I think that either one on its own is inadequate in these kinds of situations. I think it's critically important that in this case the government of Sweden is a majority owner or substantial minority owners, 37 percent, summoned the company and you gave them homework. I think that's very appropriate. But uh, I think that in this kind of situation, and I really mean this generically beyond this particular incident uh, and set of issues, that there is an important role for home country governments of these companies to give clear guidance and at some time, in some cases, clear recommendations yeah. to companies uh, as to what the red lines should be and where they should be drawn. And there are plenty of precedents for that in other industries, oil and mining among them. These issues are too complicated uh, to be left merely to governments or companies alone. We need to work on them together in a multi-stakeholder context. Thank you. So um, um, I'm going to just let you know of just a couple of things that I think are relevant um, um, as moderator. One is that this conversation will obviously continue. Um, the Silicon Valley Human Rights Conference is next sitting in Rio. Uh, May 31st, June 1st, which, which is, a, which is a, a, a conference which is specifically designed to tackle these issues, so it's an open invitation to people um, to attend that. Um, I'm also going to abuse my position as moderator to tell you that I have copies of the Telco Action Plan, uh, which, uh, which you can have a look at, which tries to set out a framework. Uh, it's informed by the RUGI framework and, of course, the GNI uh, as well. And, uh, I might just also refer you to the Global Proxy Cloud, which is something which we are launching this week, um, which is basically a way in which you can assist people who live on the other side of the firewall um, by providing your bandwidth to assist them in jumping the firewall. So thank you very much, and thank you very much to the audience, and thank you to the Swedish government for enabling this very important discussion to take place. Thank you. Thank you.